Good morning. This is Cecil and Blues. Thank you for joining me for this Darkest Dungeon boss guide. I will put a series of links up at this time. You can use them to skip ahead to a specific boss if you'd like. There are also links in the video description that will serve the same purpose. There are three ranks for each boss in Darkest Dungeon. At higher ranks, the target has extra hit points, higher resistances, additional actions per round, greater accuracy, and additional effect percentages will increase. While the fights remain relatively the same, these increases can sometimes invalidate lower level tactics. I will avoid hard numbers in these summaries to accommodate for the multiple difficulty levels. When I say moderate, low, or high, I mean relative to the level of the encounter. For example, an 80% blight resistance sounds high, but for a level 5 encounter, I would consider that to be moderate. If you haven't already clicked ahead, I'll move on to the first boss. The Necromancer. The first boss in the ruins will start alone in position 1. Each time it attacks, it will also summon a single skeletal minion and move backwards one position. If the enemy ranks are full, this effect will not trigger, but it will replace any corpses that are present. The Necromancer can use all three of its attacks from any position. The Flesh is Willing deals moderate damage to positions 1 and 2. The Crawling Dead deals low damage to positions 3 and 4. And the ability 6 feet under causes 10 to 15 stress to all units. The Necromancer is an unholy and eldritch type enemy. It has minimal resistances to all effects except for stun. Keep damage high on the Necromancer, but do not allow yourself to be overrun. Try and eliminate minions as they are summoned. The Prophet The second boss in the ruins will start in position 4, with three wooden pews of increasing hit points filling slots 1, 2, and 3. The pews do not attack and strictly serve as a barrier. They are essentially immune to all debuffs, but if reduced to 0 hit points, they will not leave behind a corpse. The Prophet is able to use all of his abilities from any position, and is able to target any unit in your roster. All of the Prophet's single target attacks have a percentage chance of affecting a second target. Eye on You is a high percentage stun that also causes 10 to 15 stress. Fulminate is a blight attack that hits all units. Calamitous Prognostication is a marking skill that allows the Prophet to target that unit with Rubble of Ruin. Rubble of Ruin is an extremely high damage attack. The mark from Calamitous Prognostication will not follow the unit if they move to a different position, so it is possible to switch places to control who is hit with Rubble of Ruin. The Prophet is an unholy enemy and has very low resistances to Blight, Bleed, and Debuffs. Due to the extremely high damage of Rubble of Ruin, debuffs that reduce damage will have a dramatic effect on this fight. Using high damage skills that target the back row, such as Hellion's Iron Swan, can end this fight quickly, but it is worth noting that for each wooden pew that is defeated during the encounter, you will be rewarded with a Shattered Pew Piece, which has a very high gold cell value. The Swine The first boss in the Warrens starts in position 1 and takes up 3 slots. He will be joined by Wilbur, a low hit point target who applies marks to your heroes and may stun them. The Swine is a slow unit and will almost always attack last. He will use the single target Obliterate Body or multi-target Obliterate Masses on marked units for heavy damage. These attacks will remove the mark from their targets. If no marked targets exist, the Swine will use Wild Flailing instead for only moderate damage to a single target. If Wilbur is killed, the Swine will start using Enraged Destruction every turn, which deals the same damage as Wild Flailing, except it hits all four of your heroes. Each time Wilbur takes damage, the Swine will get a free action with Enraged Destruction, even if he is stunned at the time. You can mitigate damage to the marked units by using Man at Arms Defender or Houndmaster's Guard Dog to redirect the damage to a non-marked unit. 
the Arbalist's Flare ability can clear marks, and the Bounty Hunter's Flashbang deals zero damage, allowing you a chance to stun Wilbur without triggering a counterattack. The Swine is a beast-type enemy and has weak resistance to Blight, Bleed, and debuffs. Due to this low resistance, stacking damage debuffs is a viable strategy for this boss. Wilbur is a beast-type enemy with weak resistance to Blight, Bleed, debuffs, and move skills with moderate resistance to stun. If you have defeated the boss, the Swine, but Wilbur is still alive and your party is in danger of dying, you can retreat from this fight, and it will still be considered a victory. The Flesh The second boss in the Warrens is an Eldritch-type enemy that appears as four individual targets who share a single health pool. Each individual target will shapeshift into one of four forms at the beginning of each round. Each form has access to a single skill and possesses unique defensive statistics. It is possible for multiple copies of the same form to be on the board at once, while others may not be present every round. The Head has moderate physical defense and low resistance to Blight, Bleed, and debuffs, but strong stun resistance. When the Head acts, it will use Maw of Life on a single target, able to reach rank 1 and 2 with a moderate damage attack that also applies a bleed and has a percentage chance of hitting a second target. The Bone has high physical defense and stun resistance, but low resistance to Blight, Bleed, and debuffs. When the Bone acts, it will use Bone Zephyr, a single target attack, able to hit any hero position, dealing low damage along with a stun. The Heart has no physical defense and minimal resistance to Blight, Bleed, Debuff, and Stun. When the Heart acts, it will use Sanguine Stroke, a moderate single target heal. The Butt has low physical defense and low resistance to Stun, Blight, Bleed, and Debuffs. When the Butt acts, it will use Undulating Invasion, a single target attack able to reach ranks 3 and 4, dealing moderate damage that also applies a Blight. It has a percentage chance of hitting a second target. High resistances to Blight and Bleed on your heroes is helpful for this fight. Consumables can be used to great effect. Since these multiple units share a single health pool, multi-target abilities are exceptionally potent. Hounds, Harry, and Plague Bombs in particular. Target hearts with physical attacks whenever possible. The Hag The first boss in the Weald starts occupying positions 3 and 4, with an empty cauldron taking up positions 1 and 2. These units cannot be moved. If the cauldron is empty, the Hag will almost always use Into the Pot, placing one of your heroes into her cauldron. While occupied, the cauldron will become vulnerable to attack. Each time an action is taken by any unit, the hero inside the pot will take 8.75% of their health in damage, eventually taking them to death's door after a maximum of 12 actions have been performed. The cauldron will dump out the hero when either its hit points are reduced to zero, or the hero within reaches death's door. When your hero is returned to you, it will be placed in position 1, sliding back the rest of your team. The Cauldron has extremely high resistance to all status effects. The Hag has three other abilities. Meat Tenderizer, a low damage attack that hits all units. Season to Perfection, a negligible damage attack that causes 10 stress and applies an accuracy and damage debuff to a single target. And Taste the Stew, a negligible damage attack that causes 10 stress and also heals the Hag for a moderate amount. The Hag is a human-type enemy who has high Blight resistance and stun resistance, but minimal resistance to bleed and other debuffs. The Hag has relatively low hit points, and most of her attacks do minimal damage. Unless a crucial damage dealer has been placed inside the pot, it is best to focus damage on the Hag and end the fight as fast as possible. Bring strong range direct damage dealers to this encounter. As a note, if you retreat from this battle while a healer is inside the cauldron, that hero will die. 
The Brigand Pounder. The second boss in the wield will start in position 2 with three brigand units to support it. One of the brigands will be a special unit called Matchman, Fusemen, or Pyro depending on the level of the encounter. This unit is incredibly slow and should always be the last unit to act on any round. If the Brigand Pounder is alive, it will use the ability Fire in the Hole, giving the Pounder a free action, which will either be Misfire, a zero damage attack that restores 10 stress to your whole party, or BOOM! An extremely high damage attack hitting all heroes and causing 15 stress. It is imperative that the Matchman not be allowed to act, either through stun or death. Without a Matchman, the only ability the Pounder has access to is Reinforcements, which activates at the start of each turn and will summon replacement bandit units. This will always summon a Matchman if one is not present. Duplicate units will never appear simultaneously. The Matchman will often end up pushed into position 4, but can be moved around. It is essential to have a versatile team. The Pounder itself has high physical defense and extremely strong resistance to all status effects. Control is important in this fight. While the Matchman is the highest priority, other bandit units should be managed as well while you slowly chip away at the Pounder. A bandit who has already taken an action is a poor target because it will be replaced by a fresh bandit next turn. By alternating stuns, you can have the threat of a unit. Ignoring the Fusilier and hewing through blanket fire with a Vestal is a viable strategy. Ignoring all bandit units except for the Matchman will reduce the duration of this fight, but the incoming damage adds up quickly. At the top level of difficulty, the additional health and dodge rating on the Matchman can make this fight shockingly difficult. A no healer marking party is a viable strategy for this encounter, but getting through the wield without a healer is its own challenge. The Siren The first boss in the cove will start in position 1 and occupies 2 slots. The Siren is an eldritch type enemy and has no physical resistance, only moderate blight and debuff resistance, but fairly high stun and bleed resistance. The Siren also has only moderate movement resistance, at least compared to other bosses. The Siren has two attack actions, Devour, a low damage attack that hits all heroes and applies a bleed, and Pressure Crash, a negligible damage attack that hits all heroes and causes 10 to 15 stress. Far more dangerous are the Siren's other two abilities. High Tide will summon an Eldritch minion to her aid, and Song of Desire will charm one of your heroes, moving them to the enemy side of the battle for two turns. The Siren can only control one hero unit at a time, and will only summon one Eldritch minion, if none are currently present. Song of Desire is considered a debuff and can be resisted. Trinkets and Holy Water can greatly minimize the difficulty of this encounter. The Siren is very fast and will likely take her first action before your party has a chance to act. Having an adaptable team is important because units on both sides of the fight will often be shuffled by Song of Desire. Stunning charmed units is a way to limit their impact on the fight. Due to her low defenses, an all-out assault is not a poor strategy for this encounter though the Champion Siren has a considerable amount of hit points. The Siren is not limited to charming male party members, and the charmed heroes have access to all of their skills regardless of what they are equipped with. Man-at-Arms is a poor choice for this encounter as his buffs and guard ability are a liability if he is charmed. If you run from combat while one of your heroes is charmed, that unit will die. The Crew The second boss in the cove is an unholy type enemy with no physical defenses, a low blight and debuff resist, but moderate to high stun and bleed resist, and very high but not insurmountable movement resistance. 
At the start of every round, the crew will use All Hands on Deck, a movement skill that deals zero damage and attempts to move the targeted hero to the first position while also summoning a drowned anchorman, who has only one ability, Heave 2. This attaches an anchor to the hero in the first position, immobilizing them but not stunning them. This effect will deal continuous stress damage to the hero affected. The first time the Anchorman uses Heave 2, it will heal itself to full hit points. While the Anchor is out, the crew will heal a small amount every time any unit takes an action. Prior to using Heave 2, the Anchorman has a large defensive bonus, but once it ditches its Anchor, that buff is passed to the crew, leaving the Anchorman vulnerable to attack. It is advisable to kill the Anchorman only after it has dropped Anchor to prevent the heals from stacking up. It is possible to stun the Anchorman on the turn it is summoned, delaying its Heave 2 ability by one turn. One possible strategy is to give a massive movement skill buff to an occultist or bounty hunter through trinkets and attempt to pull the crew forward after they have summoned an Anchorman but before it has a chance to use Heave 2. If successful, it will prevent further Anchorman from being summoned and the existing one will be unable to use its attack. This is no small feat though, as you are attempting to overcome a 100%, 120%, or 145% movement resist depending on the level of the encounter. The crew itself does have additional attacks it will use during the fight. All of the crew's attacks are single target and can reach any hero position. Mutiny deals negligible damage and applies a debuff, lowering the target's damage and crit chance. Drink with the Dead deals negligible damage and causes 10 to 15 stress. Boarding Clutch is a low damage attack that also applies a bleed. Bringing units that deal increased damage to Unholy will help considerably, but dealing with the Anchorman efficiently is the true key to ending this encounter quickly. The Collector this boss has a 5% chance to spawn in place of a random encounter any time your inventory is over 65% full. The Collector is a human and eldritch type enemy who will start in position 1. It has no physical resistance, low resistance to blight, bleed, debuff, and movement effects, but moderate to high resistance to stun. The Collector has three abilities. The first, Collect Call, summons three minions and moves the Collector back to position 4. The possible minions that can be summoned are the Collected Vestal, Collected man -at arms and Collected Highwaymen. Any combination of these units is possible. This ability is the only ability the Collector can use in Position 1, but it may also use it in Position 2. Show Collection is an attack that deals negligible damage to Positions 1 and 2 and causes 10 to 15 stress. This ability can be used while the Collector is in Position 2, 3, and 4. Lifesteal is a single target attack capable of targeting positions 2, 3, and 4 that deals low damage and applies a bleed. It also heals the collector for the damage done. This attack can only be used while the collector is in positions 3 or 4. The collected highwayman can deal significant damage with headhunt, a single target attack that also applies a bleed. The collected man-at-arms will use head games, guarding the collector and providing itself with a defensive bonus. The collected Vestal has two abilities. The first, Headache, gives a massive damage buff to the collector, and the second, Headstrong, is a powerful heal. Since this is a random encounter, it is difficult to plan a party composition for optimal performance, but eliminate or stun collected Vestals to prevent buff stacking or massive heals, stun or kill collected man-at-arms to disable their guard while focusing as much damage as you can on the collector. Once the collector is dead, Vestals and man-at-arm minions become harmless, so it may be possible to take a couple of turns to recover at the end of the fight. Just remember there are penalties for extended combat. Defeating the Collector has a chance to award one of several very rare head-based trinkets. The Shambler This boss can be spawned by placing a torch inside a Shambler's altar, a curio that has a chance to appear in any zone. There is also a very small chance that it will appear in place of a random encounter if your light level is zero. 
Summoning the Shambler immediately snuffs out your torch, reducing light to zero. It will always surprise your party, even if it doesn't surprise you. The Shambler is an Eldritch type enemy who will start in position one and occupies two spaces. It has three abilities that it can use from any position. Abduri's advancement deals negligible damage to all party members and applies a bleed. This also moves the Shambler forward one space and spawns two Shambler tentacles. Undulating Withdrawal deals negligible damage to all party members and applies a blight. This also moves the Shambler back one position and summons two Shambler tentacles. Centurious Lament deals negligible damage to all party members, causes 10 stress, and shuffles party order. It also moves the Shambler back one position, but does not summon any minions. The Shambler has moderate physical resistance, high stun resist, but only moderate resistance to other status effects. The Shambler tentacles have only one ability, Clapper Claw. This is a single target attack that initially deals low damage, causes 10 stress, but it also provides the tentacle with a terrifyingly powerful buff, increasing its damage by 50% and defenses by 25% each turn. Stress will be out of control for this encounter. In addition to the stress attacks, you are fighting in pitch darkness, and while the Shambler may deal very low damage with its attacks, critical hits are not uncommon, causing additional stress. Ending this encounter as quickly as possible is crucial. If you are able to eliminate both tentacles with a single attack, or with units who are unable to reach the Shambler, this is advisable. But it may benefit you to leave a single tentacle alive in hopes that the Shambler uses Centurious Lament instead of summoning new minions. It is also strongly advised that if you are using the Altar to fight this boss, you do so after you have completed your current quest objectives. Your party will rarely be in a position to continue adventuring after facing a Shambler. Defeating the Shambler will reward you with one of the extremely powerful Ancestral Trinkets. Thank you for watching this guide. If you found it helpful, feel free to click the like button to show your support. You can also follow the channel to be notified when new videos are uploaded. I have a Darkest Dungeon Let's Play series where I play far too cautiously. You can check that out. And I may produce other Darkest Dungeon guides. Links to them will appear right now if they exist. If you have any feedback, you can provide that below in the comments section, or you can follow me on Twitter at ItsVotes. Thank you once again, and I hope you have a great day.